All right, good afternoon, everybody, and a happy new year from me. Um, welcome to this meeting of the Audit Committee. Um, start off with uh, apologies for absence, please. Uh, good afternoon. Apologies for absence have been received from councillors Peter Clark, Brian Strong, and Sheila Woodhouse. Yes. Sorry, I, I'm going to have to leave at uh, three o'clock for an, a, another meeting, but uh, hopefully we'll have gone a fair way into the agenda by then. <laughs> yes, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'd just like to do some introductions of uh, people who, who uh, are not members of the, not councillors and members of the committee. Uh, we'll just start off here on the top table. Um, we've got um, Peter Davis at the at the end there. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Peter Davis, Chief Officer for Resources and Acting Section 151 Officer. Andrew Wathen, Chief Internal Auditor. I'm Philip White and I'm the late Chair of the Committee. Wendy Barnard, Democratic Services. And now we'll go down to the front table with colleagues from the Welsh Audit Office, I believe. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Alison Rees from the Wales Audit Office. Charlotte Owen from the Wales Audit Office. Uh, Gareth Lucy, Financial Audit Manager with the Wales Audit Office. Rodri Davis, Financial Audit Lead, Wales Audit Office. And now, who else have we got here up on the on the back on the back row? I think. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Perhaps starting um, with Tracy. Yep. Yeah? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tracy Harry, Head of People Services. Mm. Emma Davis, Performance Officer. Richard Jones, Performance Manager. Ian Saunders, Chief Operating Officer for Mon Life. Richard Simkins, Business and Commercial Manager for Mon Life. Now we've got some people in the public gallery. I think they're colleagues rather than uh, members of the public. Um, so no need to introduce yourselves, but if you are going to take part in the meeting, you'll have to come down to be able to use the microphones. Okay, good. Um, the next item on the agenda is declarations of interest. Uh, usually happy to say you can make declarations as we go through the agenda, but I believe uh, Councillor Fikins just wants to make a couple of points. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just the declarations of uh, personal interest on 7 and 8 and also on 10. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Eason. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Uh, ditto, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is the public open forum. I don't believe we have any members of the public present, so I'm going to move on. Um, I will just say at this point I'm going to change the running order on the agenda a little bit. I'm going to move up 7 and 8 to come uh, after 4. Um, this is uh, for, uh, for someone's uh, convenience. So uh, the next item on the agenda now is going to be the action list from the previous meeting. I believe there were three. Um, one is about performance management, which I think is down to, to Mr. Davis, if you want to make a statement about that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, members of the committee uh, will be aware that this, uh, this action has been sitting uh, on the uh, action log uh, for quite, a, a quite some time now, and uh, uh, it concerns uh, our annual appraisal process, uh, so you should be aware of updates I've been providing you in intermittently probably over the last 6 to 12 months, and as we look to make improvements to our processes. Um, it's probably, I guess it's been, uh, pro uh, as much as it's been uh, probably frustrating for the Audit Committee in getting us to that absolute point of comfort and reassurance that we've got um, um, not so much appropriate arrangements in place, that, but, but we've got uh, a satisfactory level of comfort that our uh, monitoring arrangements, i.e. ensuring that, as is the entitlement of every, every one of our colleagues, to receive some form of uh, appraisal or supervision that that is taking place. Uh, we're, we're having difficulty at the moment in uh, um, putting 
suitable strength into that arrangement and uh, most recently and as members of the committee will be aware from my last update uh, we have uh, you, we are now using the service improvement planning process to uh, look to uh, ensure that managers provide bring forward information on appraisals that are being undertaken um, that process is taking some time to bed in uh, we are having some issues just in terms of uh, levels of awareness and understanding around the pro the, the new process uh, so what i'm what, I, what i'm looking to do is i'm I, I will look to provide a separate note to members of the committee uh, I, I will look to do that today uh, just to provide uh, a level of detail uh, that s summarizes uh, <coughs> the uh, how how we are looking to capture uh, uh, reporting of annual appraisals um, in all likelihood that's probably uh, it's probably going to be after outturn that we're going to be in a position to actually report back into the committee um, one of the reasons for that is that uh, we want to inbuild uh, an additional level of quality assurance at the end of the financial year um, so once the service business uh, service improvement planning process comes uh, to its natural conclusion at the end of this year, uh, we will actually look to go back to managers and look to validate and reassure ourselves on those statistics. We will then look to bring those back into the committee, and obviously committee then can look to discuss uh, and challenge them as necessary. So I just chair, I just wanted to sort of highlight that, but I will look to provide some further detail by way of an update uh, uh, update note to members of the committee subsequent to this meeting. Thank you for that. Does anybody have any any queries or want to make any points? If not, yeah, thank you very much. I'll I'll move on. Um, the next action point was about unfavourable audit opinions, and I think that's now items 40 to 16 on the agenda. So I think we can put that there. And then uh, the self-evaluation um, questionnaire, I believe that has been sent out to committee members. I don't know if you want to just say a few words about it. Thanks, Jim. And yeah, that went out uh, yesterday. Um, it's for members' information and to assess how effective you think the audit committee has been run. Um, if you could complete it and return it back to me within a fortnight, all the information is on there, but if anybody does have any questions in the interim, please get in touch and we'll, we can sort that out. When I've collected all of that information, I'll collate it, all the responses, and then feed back to all the committee in due course, Jim. Yeah, I noticed one or two of the questions that are quite technical about whether the committee is conforming with various, uh, various legislation. Uh, fortunately, you provided some helpful appendices to uh, help us guide us through that, so um, have a look at it anyway. Um, but thank you very much for that. Okay, then, well, unless there's any questions about that, I'm going to move on to agenda item seven and eight, which I'm going to take together. And I'd like our colleagues um, from the Wales Audit Office to, to introduce these papers. That's, I believe, going to be um, Gareth Lucy and Rodri Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this shouldn't take uh, very long today. <laughs> Um, be quite quick. Um, just here today to present uh, the independent examiner's report on Monmouthshire Farm School Endowment Trust Fund for the financial statements year ended 31st of March 2019. This is an independent examination, examination and involves reviewing whether the charity has, in all material aspects, maintained accounting records in accordance with Section 130 of the Act and prepared, prepared accounts which account with the accounting records and comply with the accounting requirements of the Act. I'd just like to point out at this moment, it's not an audit. It doesn't provide the same level of assurance that an audit does provide. This is detailed in paragraph four of Appendix One, which has been incorrectly referred to as Appendix Five, but I assure you it is Appendix One. Um, the proposed examination report or independent examination report is an unqualified examination report. In terms of significant matters that arose during our examination, there were no material misstatements uncorrected. There was one misstatement that has been corrected, which we'd like to draw to management, and that was simply that one of the comparatives 
for creditors hadn't been brought forward correctly, and that was it. So a very good independent examination, very good set of accounts. I'd just like to draw your attention to point seven, which says all the information was provided to us in a timely and helpful manner. And I'd just like to thank Nikki and her officers and her team for what was a very smooth independent examination. Uh, happy to take any questions, Chair. Uh, if you want, Nikki to. Yep, okay. Well, at this stage, I just uh, invite Nikki Wellington whether she has um, any uh, points she wishes to raise or wants to make any response to the report. Well, then I'll throw it open to the committee. Questions and observations, please. Comments? I mean, these, these are accounts that, that, that we see in this form every year. Yes, Councillor Murphy. Uh, only to say that um, I think all of us keep a pretty close eye on, 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 the, on this one. There's nothing there that we didn't expect to, to see, so I'm quite happy to, uh, to uh, approve the accounts. I think it's um, it's really for us to to note the um, well, to it, note the independent examination. It's, it's and, to note the, and, yeah, but, uh, yeah, and and for those who aren't familiar with the jargon, the unqualified thing. means that they're they're in fine fettle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, unless there's anything else people would like to make comments they'd wish to make, then I'll uh, go back now to item five on the agenda, which is a presentation about um, training for. Uh, from the internal audit from about, about uh, anti-bribery. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Afternoon, members. Um, this will be a, a very whistle-stop tour through the UK Bribery Act um, 2010. Members will be aware that the, from a corporate point of view, the compliance with the Anti-Bribery Act has been looked at from an internal audit perspective and has come back with unfavourable opinions uh, over the last couple of years, resulting in a, a reasonable opinion with the, the latest follow-up review that we undertook. So this is part of that process. This is raising awareness of anti-bribery across the authority. So the intention is to roll it out for you as audit committee members, roll it out to senior management team, and then make it available to all staff on the hub. And we're, I'm working with our <coughs> training manager to develop that process. So if I take questions at the end, that'll be quite helpful. So in terms of uh, Monmouthshire County Council, where are we with the Anti Bribery Act 2010? This is just some information uh, where the UK government has pulled together quite a significant amount of legislation over a number of years and brought it together for 2010. Um, it does relate to all businesses, and, um, large and small, and also to the public sector. It's not about uh, the, the multi-million pound contracts and, and business. It can also be applicable to um, quite small instances of bribery. So as the slide shows, the first three convictions under the Act were quite small. First one was a, a young magistrate's court clerk. Second, an aspiring private hire taxi driver who tried to offer a £300 to a council licensing officer, and an overseas student who tried to bribe his lecturer. So just throwing this out to the, to the floor, really, how, <coughs> how serious do you think this is in terms of what are the consequences if you, if you found guilty of the bribery act? Um, just because I'm on the um, licensing committee as well, and I'm looking at the, in particularly the private hire taxi driver, this bribery thing there. I mean, for me, I, I, I think that the, the way we operate our licensing system for taxis and so on is first class. But, uh, my experience of uh, being on, the, licen uh, on the, uh, the licensing committee is this, that when something happens, if, so, if, a, if an officer goes out and catches someone doing what they shouldn't be doing. The next meeting we have here of the licensing committee, 
they are here to explain, you know, why they've gone awry, if I put it that way. So from my, from my point of view, um, I, I think that we, on, on that, from the licensing side, I think we spot on. We've got very good officers there, I have to say. And, uh, they know backward and coming forward, which is, which is excellent. And uh, I, I'm quite, you know, I, I uh, you know, there's, there's never anything about bribery, you know, they, they're quite upfront about what they do and uh, they're quite e explicit in, in, to the committee, you know, when, when they decide upon a certain action. So I would commend them for what they do and uh, I never have any doubt in, in my mind that, they, you know, they're all up there above board at all times. Okay, thanks, thanks Councillor. And we'll cover that in terms of impact on who it could, uh, could affect in a moment. In terms of uh, seriousness, um, they're all serious, aren't they? Because um, if it starts w with a small amount, uh, who knows how it, it's, it's going to escalate. So if you come across any form of uh, bribery, it needs, it needs stamping on because you don't know what it's going to lead to. Yeah, another excellent point. And again, we'll, we'll cover that in a moment in terms of how, how to deal with <coughs> awareness of um, being bribed or knowing or suspecting a bribe as well. But in terms of significance... Councillor Eason had a, a point to make. I sorry, think. sorry. Councillor Eason. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll try to keep my voice going. Um, the th three topics put before us there. One, the young magistrate's court clerk, no idea what sort of aspirations of bribery that person was going to carry out. But bribery is bribery at the, at the end of the day, whether it be a pound or it be multi-millions. And I think that is the, that is the essence of it. But coming back to the, the middle one, where, but the taxi driver trying to offer a bribe to a council licensing officer, that opens the door to lots of other things that could be done in terms of bribery. So I think they're all, all serious. Where they get to in the legal system, I, I wouldn't like to guess. Okay, I'll try and enlighten you then. We'll cover that point in a moment. Yeah. Um, so the consequences are serious and significant in that it's maximum 10 years imprisonment and unlimited fines. So, and as you say, small or large, the, the, the impact is quite significant on an individual. And we'll, we'll come to those three in a moment. Um, sorry, in terms of what they actually did. But the first one um, got six years jail sentence. Second one, a two-month suspended sentence. And the third one, a 12-month jail term with a fine of £4,800. So they might, might seem insignificant, but the consequences are very significant. So moving on then, how, who can it impact on and what's the risk in terms of central government, local government? Why would somebody want to bribe somebody else? Because people within the public sector have influential positions. We deal with a lot of public money. Um, we allocate funds, we allocate licenses, which we talked about, um, and there are people out there who want to take advantage of that. So um, if there's an element of corruption and sometimes criminals or people who have influential positions within a, a contractual position within a, a company may want to seek an advantage by potentially bribery or offering a bribe to central government employees. Likewise, local government employees, we talked about licensing already, waiting lists, um, grants, etc. So there are risks within local government in terms of bribery. So what is bribery? The Act defines it as a transaction between two people. And what is a bribe? It does talk about an advantage, but doesn't actually define it. But we'll go through some examples and some, some instances of to determine when you think you're being bribed or um, how to recognise being offered a bribe. So should it have tangible benefits? Oops, sorry. No? Not necessarily. There can be favours, can be monetary awards, can be benefits for you or members of your family. Um, I just need to add that this slide presentation was put together by myself and the training manager. So some of the examples um, may be a bit of maybe a bit interesting, but we tried to just uh, 
make it a bit light-hearted if, as best we could, really. So I'm going long way. Does a bribe to need to be large? Well, we can all surmise of what happens when somebody offers a bribe. Um, it could be, as I said, monetary values. It could be um, gifts. It could be a, a number of dif different uh, opportunities. But it could also be on a regular basis. So it could be items of small gifts or hospitality, which are delivered on a regular basis. Or there could be um, larger items, cars perhaps, presents, um, over a period of time. So you just need to be aware of what's being offered and how it's being offered and what the intention is in terms of why that's being offered. So does it need to be given to you directly by the potential giver? Answers no, can be done on behalf of somebody or can be done by a third party. Does a bribe have to be given in advance? No, uh, can be given before or after the event. And part of this is about either doing something or not doing something in return for a favor or, or an advantage. So it's just being aware of those conversations and those situations that you might find yourself in working within the public sector. So I guess in summary, what I've been building up to is that a bribe is where I give you something and I get something in return, or I ask for something from you before I do something in return, or maybe not do something in return. Or I offer to give you something and I expect to get something in return, and promise something before I do or don't do something within the public sector. <coughs> so within the, the three cases mentioned earlier, uh, the magistrate's court clerk was paid to forget to enter traffic penalties for speeding onto legal basis and was paid a financial reward for that up to 500 pound per time. The would-be taxi driver wanted the license without passing any tests and the university student who tried to bribe his lecturer wanted a higher grade. These were all considered to be, to be <coughs> bribes and obviously, as I mentioned pre previously, they were sentenced so they were convicted of criminal act. Part of being in this position, again, is, is just being aware of conversations and it's not my, what you might get or what you might not get. It's all about the, the job you're involved with and the trust. So the act revolves around the breach of trust, um, which is the, the offence, especially working within the public sector. Uh, we all have to bear in mind the Nolan principles which is the, the backbone of what public sector is all about and the uh, expectations of individuals working within the public sector and they're outlined in the next slide. So there's accountability, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, leadership, honesty and openness. All things we need to consider when we're delivering our duties as public sector employees. So. Could I be subject to or come across bribery in my job? Could I be bribed? When we roll this out to the um, wider audience and, and provide more detailed training, then we'll discuss this in a kind of group discussion and have some examples. But the simple answer is, is yes. So, We've got some scenarios, but these are just the responses to those scenarios. So it's probably a bit difficult to read off the slide at the moment, but you'll pick these up when I send the packs around after the presentation. So it's just to bear in mind conversations you might or might not have with, with individuals, whether you can influence contracts within the work that we're doing within the public sector, even if you're on holiday and somebody to, and, they, and you bump into a contractor and they start talking to you about work and potential contracts and they offer to pay for things, then that could consider be considered to be a bribe. Get in local builders who are doing work for you as part of your council work to do work for you in your own property at a reduced price, that could also be considered as a bribe. And there are other examples. 
So what could I do about it? As mentioned before, um, as one of the councillors mentioned, is to do something about it. There are do's and don'ts. So we just need to make sure we're aware of the situation. We need to read our organisation's policies and procedures, which are on the hub and are updated. Never do anything or agree to do anything in return for something if you're uncomfortable about why. Never take anything or agree to t take anything if you're unsure what is expected of you. If there's any doubt whatsoever, tell your manager or supervisor or refer it to, to internal audit or external audit. Don't play detective as you could get yourself into greater difficulty. Don't get complacent and think that you know the difference between a gift and a bribe. Don't do anything for a colleague that you think might be wrong. So raising awareness is one thing, having the conversation, but also making sure we're aware of our procedures within the organisation. We have financial procedure rules. We have anti-fraud, corruption and, and bribery policy. We've got the whistleblowing procedure. Um, all kind of help in terms of if you, if you feel uncomfortable about a discussion or an approach or a situation, then there's opportunities to refer it on to um, either your, your manager directly, your head of service, or through me, an internal audit, or the external audit. <laughs> and between, between myself and Section 151, who's currently Peter, we'll determine the best way forward. Thank you, Chair. Any questions? Over to the committee if you want to um, ask anything about it or... Make a comment. Yes, Councillor Watkins. Um, no questions about it, but just a, a general comment. That looks quite thorough and um, enough group, engage, group discussion engagement, which hopefully will get people to think about how it might actually apply in their lives as well, which I think is really important because people need to not just see it as something that happens out there. They've actually got to think about how that actually might affect them within the workplace. So that looks quite good. And is this um, a training that uh, officials in the in the council will be will be getting? Is it part of the training materials? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The, the intention is to roll out to the senior management team um, and and have that kind of <coughs> more detailed discussion and more detailed training with the examples. Um, then we're going to make it available on the the hub and raise awareness for all staff as well. Any other points anyone would like to make? Well, thank you for the presentation, Andrew. I thought it um, did uh, did make me start to think about when you get your lunch at a, a meeting up at um, up at Bullthwells or wherever it was, whether that, that was a, a, yeah. a gift or a bribe. Um, yes, Councillor Murphy. Um, just something that came to, to mind as, as you, you were saying that, Chair. Um, we always do have the sort of rule of thumb that there was a £25 limit, was it? Um, if, if you considered the, the value of something you had was in excess of £25, you had to report it, otherwise you didn't. Does, it, I mean, that was a long time ago. Is, is that still the broad pressure approach, or as time marched on? That is still the same. Yeah, there's that limit. There's, we've got a gifts and hospitality procedure. Um, because from time to time, dealing with people, you may get pens, calendars, um, lunches, etc., as part of your routine work. But in terms of the Bribery Act, you just need to think of: is there an, is there an alternative, mo ulterior motive for somebody giving you that gift? And if there is, then you need to think twice about it. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll move on then. Um, I'll move on to the next item on the agenda then, which is uh, back to our Welsh Audit Office colleagues. It's going to be the Wales Audit Office review of whistleblowing and fairness of work arrangements. And I'm going to invite uh, Charlotte Owen and Alison Rees, I think, to introduce the, uh, introduce the item. Thank you very much, Chair. The focus of this particular review, uh, just to give you a bit of background information and some context to this work, we looked at the Council's arrangements for dealing with whistleblowing concerns as well as the arrangements for dealing with employee um, grievances through your uh, fairness at work policy. 
We also looked as, at part of this review through the decision-making arrangements the Council has to determine whether any concerns or grievances are dealt with through whistleblowing or the fairness of work policy. And we also took the opportunity to reflect on the Council's progress in addressing our 2014 mm -hmm. proposals for improvement, which we made when we looked at the whistleblowing <coughs> policies and support and arrangements back then. <coughs> so the overall review question, the question that we were seeking to answer, is can the Council assure itself that it has robust and effective arrangements for dealing with whistleblowing disclosures and employee grievances. Now we undertook this work in May 2019 and we spoke to a few people, we gathered evidence in a, in a number of different ways and I'd like to thank the officers involved in actually coordinating and organising it. Um, we had uh, focus groups um, with a number of managers we spoke to those managers who had experience in dealing with um, and, and uh, addressing employee grievances, as well as those managers and head teachers um, who haven't. We did a number of document reviews and we also looked at some of the case files as well. We um, had interviews with officers and cabinet members. We also interviewed some officers who have investigated whistleblowing disclosures within the council. And we also had a group interview with all the HR business partners. And finally, we uh, viewed the standards committee meeting that was held in March of last year, because within that committee meeting, they had a report on whistleblowing cases. So following the field work, um, we concluded that the Council has responded positively to our 2014 whistleblowing review to strengthen its whistleblowing and its fairness at work arrangements and seeking feedback from those involved could lead to further improvements. We reached this conclusion for a number of reasons. The Council has strengthened its arrangements to make staff aware of these policies. There is a collective decision-making process to determine which policy to use whilst ensuring employees raising concerns are at the forefront of that decision. The Council has effective arrangements to respond to and manage whistleblowing disclosures and employee grievances and has strengthened its whistleblowing arrangements since our 2014 work. Managers demonstrated a clear understanding of the policies and procedures with HR maintaining close contact to ensure concerns are handled <coughs> effectively, stored securely, and dealt with confidentiality. <coughs> confidentiality. I can't say the word. Confidentiality. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the Council has a clear process for ongoing review of the policies, but does not actively seek feedback from those involved and members' oversight of arrangements is limited. As part of the work, as I said, we did reflect back on the 2014 proposals for improvement and we concluded that seven out of the nine proposals for improvement issued at that time have been fully addressed. One is no longer apl applicable and there's one proposal for improvement um, that is ongoing. And also within the report that we note three new proposals for improvement and these are to strengthen the arrangements to monitor and review the effectiveness of the Council's arrangements by actively seeking feedback from those involved, to clarify the implementation and monitoring arrangements of the following action within the People's Strategy, to monitor the implementation of recommendations from grievances to ensure organisational learning and development, and finally to clarify with the Standards Committee how it will assess the effectiveness of the whistleblowing policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we uh, have um, a, a response from MCC officers about the, uh, maybe about the recommendations? Thank you, Chair. Um, we welcome the proposals for improvement and we're already taking steps to implement them. Whilst um, what I would say is that uh, whilst we were already taking feedback from um, findings of grievances and whistleblowing, we didn't have a formal policy or formal arrangements in place, so we're looking to strengthen that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Eason. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, I've read this report. Um, 
your report doesn't give me a lot of confidence that the matter of grievances and whistleblowing is being sorted. Uh, there are pro recommendations to go forward. One, the important one, is you've got to clarify to the Standards Committee to assess the effectiveness of whistleblowing. You met with various people. You didn't speak to any whistleblowers. You didn't speak to any people about grievances. Um, yet, on page nine, um, as an employee, there's a question to the employees, as an employee, how confident would you feel to be able to raise concerns about potential malpractice in your environment? 53%, sorry, 20% survey came back, of which 53% shown some positiveness, which says to me that a lot of the, a lot of the staff were either not concerned about answering the questions or were not confident with, with, the, with the system. Um, I, I do, um, having read this, have concerns that um, this question about whistleblowing has gone on for a number of years, and I am I'm really conscious of the fact that um, whistleblowing has got to be given the right strength in the organisation, and not not put with not put to us with report after report. Because I think whistleblowing should have been dealt with many years ago. Um, I think the three three recommendations must be taken on board very quickly, and I think the one to go to the standards committee has got to be positive and has got to be got to be strong, but equally. I would like the Wales Audit Office to have spoken to whistleblowers and people with a grievance, uh, confidentially, obviously, to see from their perspective how they were treated um, in um, making a complaint or making a, a whistleblowing aspect to the, to the authority. So I'd like to, I'd welcome another report in the future which strengthens on what you've said so far today. Thank you. <coughs> I don't know if anyone uh, is able to respond to the <coughs> points at this point that Councillor Easton has made, but I'll, I'll throw it open to you if you want to make a response. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I would just like to clarify as well that some of the whistleblowers are anonymous. Sorry? Some of the whistleblowers are anonymous, and it's their wish to remain anonymous. <coughs> Therefore, it is not practical or feasible for us to be able to contact those individuals. Okay. Um, I understand the anonymity of some whistleblowers, but also, uh, having carried out the survey to see whether the whistleblowing policy is working, it would be useful in some way, shape or form to get that view anonymously as well. Right. Uh, so, uh, okay, over to Mr. Davis. Uh, just, just, what, just one further comment, really, just in, in response to Councillor Easton's point, um, and I think it's referred to in the report from having looked it over again uh, earlier today. So, um, and, and I think it's caught up in the recommendations in some part. So, as, as is standard practice with, with grievances, with whistleblowing investigations, um, as standard and to be tightened, going back to uh, Tracy's earlier point, um, you know, we do look to receive feedback as part of that process and uh, based on that feedback that is then acted upon, whether that is a strengthening of our processes going forward, specific recommendations that need to be acted upon by chief officers, whatever they may be. So there is already inbuilt process as part of those processes. Um, I, I take on board your point. Uh, which is probably more directed at Wales Audit Office as part of the scope of their work. Um, but of course, a uh, point well made there, just in terms of uh, whistleblowing allegations and in a lot of cases where anonymity is clearly a key issue. So um, from my perspective, um, I'm comfortable that we have suitable process and arrangement in place. Um, and accepting, I think, the recommendation that's come forward from Wales Office to further strengthen that. Okay, I'm going to go to Councillor Higginson now. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I, I noticed that um, our legal officers at the back end, and on, on the, the proposals for improvement, the one that clarify with the Standards Committee how it will assess the effect, effectiveness of the whistleblowing policy. I just wonder where the Standards Committee, uh, you know, when will they be... Uh, when will this be agended for them, if I put it that way? And, you know, obviously a decision made. Do we have um, an answer to that question? I think someone's coming down.
Just to quickly introduce yourself. And Absolutely. Then... Hi, uh, Matt Phillips, Head of Law and Monitoring Officer. Uh, I knew it'd be useful if I sat at the back, wouldn't I? Thank you, Councillor Higginson. Um, so I was one of the people interviewed as part of the um, WOEO um, work leading to the report on this. And um, one of the key things for me to try and get an understanding of was what, what is the best practice that we should be striving for. And, and Alison very kindly sent me uh, a number of reports from the NAO, and I also did a bit of further uh, research as to what the WAO does and what uh, Wales Assembly does as well. And one of the things I was a little bit confused about was there's an audit committee role in this and then there's a standards committee role. And <clears throat> I'm actually going through a process of um, reviewing the constitution at the moment, which of course includes looking at um, uh, the committees and their various terms of reference. The standards committee is predominantly designed to deal with conduct matters pertaining to councillors. And so it felt a little bit odd that whistleblowing matters sat with them. So I just wanted to understand why that was. Um, and lo looking into the, the various things that Alison sent me, there's not a statutory reason for it. And then comparing ourselves to other local authorities, some authorities have um, feedback go to the standards committee, some don't. Pretty much everyone has it go back to the audit committee though. So my, my conclusion, and um, so I took my lead from, if I can find it, um, there was a the National Audit Office report from March 2014, which was uh, making a whistleblowing policy work. Um, there's not an equivalent document in Wales, um, but I looked at the Welsh Assembly's policy um, on uh, whistleblowing. It, it's a sound document, and it was provided by the WAO, and it stated that the audit committee or equivalent uh, should do an annual review of the effectiveness of whistleblowing arrangements uh, to include number of type of concerns raised, outcomes investigations, feedback from individuals who've used arrangements, except in of course there's the point we raised about anonymity already, um, complaints of victimization or failure to maintain confidentiality, other existing reporting mechanisms, adverse incidents that could, uh, could have been identified by staff, relevant litigation and awareness, trust and confidence in the arrangements. <coughs> Um, and further, Wales Assembly policy cites the head of internal audit as the point of contact for the policy itself, and the WAO's website um, takes you to the 2014 document on public concern at work, um, which states, analysis of whistleblowing caseload should be reported regularly to senior management, the audit committee, and the board. I mean, the board relevant to, to what they're talking about there. So, actually, my conclusion was while there's a little bit of practice out there in some authorities that goes to the Standards Committee, given the Standards Committee role is predominantly councillor conduct, and there is already a fairly well-trodden path in terms of report to the Audit Committee, that actually the Audit Committee is the better um, committee for the report to be brought to. And I, you know, I read out the list of things that should be brought as well, um, and so didn't want to duplicate that work that Sally would generally do um, by having a go to Standards Committee as well. I think the other thing to draw out that is there's probably a role for a report. This, it talks about senior management, so I think an annual report to SLT as well. So, so that, that's the conclusion drawn from the, um, the, the information that Alison kindly passed me. Thank you for that, and I'm sure councillors will be reassured that the regular reporting on this is going to come back to this committee, which in the light of comments made, I think is probably a good place for it to be. Thank you. Anything else? Um, any comments and observations? Right. Uh, yes, Councillor Eason. Yes, the only, the only thing, uh, Chair, is on the point that uh, Matt has just made about proposal number three. Will that be changed to Clive back to the Audit Committee, or do you wish, wish it think, to remain as it is? I think the recommendation, the, the, the response is, yeah. is in line with what the, the yeah. officer has just said, right. that it will now come back to the Audit Committee. So it won't go to... Pro, pro, sorry, P, uh, proposal three won't apply, really, then? Well, I think it applies, but... Yeah. I think it applies, but the management response, put me right on this if I'm wrong, but the management response is saying, well, no, not the standards committee, but the audit committee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The important thing is member oversight, and, and so all of the work that I've done um, points to the fact that the audit committee is the, is the correct process. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, as with... Uh, a number of these Wales Audit Office reports, the, the role of the committee in this is, is to, to note the report 
make any comments, cons consider where uh, any other issues need to be raised. So I think we can conclude on that basis that we've noted the report and, and considered it. So thank you very much. So I shall move on now to the next item on the agenda. Do you want me to skip that then? Oh no, here, there they are, okay. Right, I'm just about to move on to the next item on the agenda then, um, which is the um, Wales Audit Office Environmental Health Follow-up Review and Management Response. And I think again, it's going to be Charlotte and Alison to introduce this paper, yes? Thank you, Chair. Yep. Uh, so the environmental health um, is a follow-up review to a national review that we undertook in 2014 on the impact of reduced resources on environmental health services. So the follow-up review considers what budgetary and staff changes have taken place in the service since 2014 and also the extent to which the Council has addressed the recommendations in the 2014 report. Uh, these are set out within um, our report but broadly cover the areas of effective scrutiny engagement with local residents on service changes, improved efficiency and value for money, and improved st strategic planning. Overall, we found that the Council has acted upon the recommendations raised in our previous report, and the Environmental Health Service currently has financial stability and should use this period to build resilience to achieving the right balance of statutory, discre discretionary, and income-generating services. Um, in terms of budget and staff, we found that since the 2014 review, staff numbers have reduced um, by three full-time equivalents, down from 21.2 to 18.2 in 2019. The posts removed included technicians and a service manager. In terms of the financial data, unfortunately the Council wasn't able to provide comparative financial data to those provided in 2014, so we've just taken figures from 2017-18 to the current year, and these show a slight increase uh, from 940,000 to 980,000, and this is largely due to increased staffing costs. So in response to the um, proposals for improvement in the previous report, in terms of scrutiny, we found that scrutiny members are provided with detailed reports about environmental health services and that the generic scrutiny training that members receive um, enables them to understand the services provided and gives them the opportunity to effectively challenge and scrutinise the service. As far as engagement goes, um, the environmental health budget changes so far have actually had a minimal impact on service users, so that has limited the need for consultation, um, so there wasn't a great deal to, to expand on that section. For improved efficiency and value for money, we found that the Council sets clear environmental health priorities within its business plans, and this includes acceptable standards of performance. The Council recognises the value of investing in both statutory and non-statutory services, and the report includes some examples of some of the non-statutory work that the Council undertakes. Um, the Council has previously um, assessed the impact of um, proposed cuts back in 2014 to public protection on statutory and non-statutory duties, um, and we felt that the Council might benefit from a fresh review of these services. Um, this is not about cutting back on non-statutory duties, but rather to give the Council an up-to-date assessment of the benefits that such services provide and how they help contribute to Council priorities. So that if any future decisions are made around service changes, these can help inform those decisions. Uh, we found that the Council collaborates with a wide range of partners on an informal basis, um, and some of those are included in the report, but we found that there's a limited range of formal partnerships, and by this we mean sharing environmental health services with other authorities or outsourcing to other providers. Where possible, we found the Council obtains grant income and it charges full costs for services. Um, it's also actively considering how to balance income generation with the delivery of statutory services. In terms of strategic planning, we found there were good arrangements in place at a service level. Um, activity and demand data is used to plan services and there's a performance management framework in place to ensure operational managers are held accountable for performance. Uh, committee papers uh, provided to support member decisions indicate that consideration is given to cost, benefit and impact of decisions, but as changes to the service have been limited in recent years, the Council has not completed detailed analysis of cost, benefit and impact. Uh, the Council explores the use of technology, for example, it's recently been trialling an app to report noise nuisance and it's also looking at um, how it can 
uh, capture evidence digitally. Um, and we've recommended that they just continue to look at what technology becomes available that can help it in terms of its efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, so we've made two proposals for improvement in this report. It's probably worth noting that these proposals for improvement don't so much relate to concerns, but are really around actions that the council can take to consider how they can ensure the service remains sustainable going forwards. So the first one is to undertake a fresh analysis of statutory and non-statutory service obligations to support and inform future service changes. Um, and in order to develop a prosperous and future-proof environmental health service, the council should consider the following. Balancing statutory duties with non-statutory services and discretionary income generation. Aligning its income generation activities with the council's overall commercial strategy and considering how the service might benefit. Working in more formal partnerships with other authorities to deliver services and exploring how transformation and technology could improve efficiency and effectiveness. The council has already over recent years considered the majority of those things, so the PFI really is for the council to consider doing what it has already done and make sure it has an up-to-date view on how it can take the service forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll invite uh, MCC officers to provide any response they wish to make. Uh, just introduce yourself before you um, make your points. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Dave Jones, Head of Public Protection, accompanied by Jill Dickian, who's the principal for the commercial side. So between us, we won't, uh, we won't uh, go into any great detail, but just uh, in terms of what's um, before members of the committee, I'll just pick up the management response. Uh, certainly, we pick up the issue regarding statutory versus non-statutory um, and the importance of the non-statutory elements. I think some authorities are very much focused on the statutory. The vast majority of what we do in environmental health is statutory. Uh, that's, I think, people uh, see as donning white coats, food safety visits, health and safety, nuisance investigations is, is the bulk of what we do in terms of our capacity. But certainly we recognize, and I think WAO have as well, uh, the critical importance of the non-statutory stuff. So in viral crimes, for example, dealing with flight tipping, litter, dog fouling, etc., is a power, not a duty. So I think um, certainly <coughs> members would notice if we sort of back down on uh, doing some of the non-statutory stuff. Jill will talk more about the sort of income generation elements when we get to P2. So I think really it's to give members assurances that um, the performance is closely monitored. In terms of that action point, we'll certainly build that into our annual report. Um, so the 1920 report will be due out now next May. Um, so certainly we'll, we'll clarify that position between statutory and non-statutory. Moving on to proposal two, um, which again talks about statutory and non-statutory. Again, I think in terms of assurance for members here, as well as internal uh, measures to, to uh, measure that performance, we're very much governed as well by external um, auditors, governing bodies, and report our performance directly to those uh, bodies, which includes the Food Standards Agency, Health and Safety Executive, Drinking Water Inspectorate, Welsh Government, and Rent Smart Wales, to mention some. So I think, again, that would give, hopefully, uh, members assurance of um, what we're doing is continually monitored. I think I'll hand over to Jill, because it does talk about income generation, and I think that's obviously key as a corporate priority, um, and the success we've had there. Thank you. Um, hello, Chair. Yeah, Jill Dickin. Uh, we do quite a bit of income generation in the commercial team. Um, we see it as a beneficial thing, not only to uh, the way the offices work, um, but also we have a good understanding of the businesses and how businesses work and we respond to that way. So it also um, aligns with the commercial strategy of generating income. Um, and we have a number of different things, not just uh, from fixed penalty notices and revisits and things like that, that we can charge for under statutory legislation, but also we have a number of uh, innovative working uh, streams that Monmouthshire has led the way basically even in the UK on such as advisory visits, paid for advisory visits, which we work well with businesses on that. This produces um, good working relationships as well as um, compliance, which means if we get more compliance, we mean we are doing less enforcement revisits. We can prioritize into the areas that need us to look at. So there's that, and there's also grant income generation. Whenever there's a grant income available, then we're always applying to that, um, and we're pretty, um, 
pretty successful in getting it, to be honest, in, in the food side of things in particular. Um, and I think that's about it from me. Well, thank you very much. Um, just, just very quickly, Chair, the, the last one then is about obviously working <coughs> groups and working with others. Uh, and again, I think we've got a good track record. Um, Environmental health certainly works very closely, not just internally in terms of housing panels, food safety, communicable disease, health and safety, and those are national panels we contribute to. I think we also work closely with Public Health Wales and others. Um, so just again to say that in terms of food poisoning plans, etc., we're not sort of working in glorious isolation. We do work across the region and nationally. And I think the very final point on P2 chair was um, concerning uh, making the most of technological advances. The noise app is something we recently introduced, which is hopefully, capacity is a real issue, I think, across environmental health um, because of the very reactive nature of the, of the service. The noise app is something we've implemented to uh, try and get the residents themselves, which tends to be residential uh, neighbor disputes, uh, to monitor it themselves, and that's a quite a good um, <laughs> effect of uh, releasing capacity for officers to uh, get them perhaps to resolve some of their issues themselves and not escalate it through uh, to environmental health as a full investigation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll throw it open to the committee then for questions and uh, observations and Councillor Easton. Thank you again, Chair. Um, I note the two recommendations that are made, but into the detailed report, you, uh, Wales Audit Office state, that the Council does not have a structured member training program for environment and health matters. Where would that training take place if it was brought in to be part of the member training and is it, would you consider to be part of the member training? I don't know where the, where the answer lies on that. Um, well, I, I, I think it'd be a fairly, I don't think you need to know the detail because that's why people do courses in Bram Cloth, I guess, and I think uh, from a member perspective and understanding what we do, I think currently the arrangement is we do it through Strong Community Select Committee. We, we report, as you know, every six months. We do produce an annual report, and I think it's uh, Councillor Dimmock's now the chair of that committee. Um, so we're certainly supportive of, if there are any issues that members want particularly uh, raising. I, I know we did a session on air quality, for example, about 18 months ago. So as well as the, the catch-all, which is fairly vast in terms, in terms of what we do, uh, we've, we've certainly willing and able to provide specific um, training or overview, if you like, in terms of specific topics. Um, yeah, I would agree with that in, in terms of there isn't necessarily a need for specific member training. I think the level of detail and information that's in the reports on environmental health is very clearly set out, and I think that does help understanding. But obviously, if members feel that they need uh, a better general level of understanding, then obviously they're welcome to go to the service to ask about receiving more specific training. Right, thank you for that. Um, any more questions or observations on the report or the response? Thank you, Councillor. Um, well, I'll just note then that the committee has um, considered the, the report and the recommendations, and um, we'll move on then to the next agenda item, which is another Wales Audit Office report, the Leisure Services Follow-up Review. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is another follow-up review, this time um, on the Council's leisure services. Uh, so we undertook a national report in 2015 looking at how councils were delivering leisure services with less uh, funding and resources. And the purpose of this review uh, was to assess uh, whether the Council was addressing the recommendations in that previous report and was it able to assure itself that the leisure service offers value for money. Uh, so the 2015 recommendations are set out in Appendix 1 of the report and they cover the broad areas of strategic planning, so things like the leisure vision and priorities, um, whether the Council has identified uh, the most appropriate delivery model using an options appraisal process um, and how it's ensuring that, that there's effective performance management and governance. So our overall finding was that the Council is making progress in addressing the national recommendations and it has considered whether the delivery of its leisure service offers value for money. We came to that conclusion because uh, the Council has a long-standing vision for its leisure services and this was most recently reviewed in 2017 as part of consideration of alternative delivery models. Um, and there's also a One Life business plan and commercial and investment strategy which was approved by members in September. 
At the time of our field work, the council was working with an external consultant to develop a strategic plan to deliver its vision, um, so that is sort of underway. In terms of delivery models, the council uh, did consider alternative delivery models for its leisure service, and paragraphs 12 to 27 of the report set out the process that was taken between 2014 and 2019. Uh, to summarise, although a decision was made in early 2018 to develop an alternative delivery model, um, in April of last year, the Council decided to retain and transform the leisure services in-house instead, and this was largely due to changes in the financial, legal and taxation situation, which meant the benefits of the alternative delivery model were, were less strong. Uh, we found that although members generally received detailed information throughout the process, members did not always receive sufficient and timely financial information to aid decision making. Uh, this was really just one isolated case. Um, a strategic outline case was presented to scrutiny and cabinet in autumn 2016. Um, and this lacked information such as the scoring matrix for the assessment criteria that each of the options was being considered against. Um, and this made it more difficult to see how the preferred delivery model, the alternative one, was selected. Um, it also lacked financial modelling for the options being considered. Um, although scrutiny did express concerns at the time about the level of detail provided, um, Cabinet did agree to move on to the next stage to develop a full business case for an alternative delivery model. However, it's really positive that the Council did listen to scrutiny's concerns and instead um, Council decided to assess the four delivery options thoroughly and through an outline business case, they did look at all those details that were missing from the, the, the original strategic outline case. Um, I, I think the, the issue with the strategic outline case was not necessarily that that information was lacking in there because it was just an outline. It was more around the fact that the recommendation um, for scrutiny and committee that came with that report was to agree the preferred model to move on. Um, but the council did rectify that, so that's really positive. In terms of performance management and governance, um, we found that the council proactively involved members in appraising the different delivery options of its, le of its leisure service. Um, and in addition to the formal committee meetings, um, officers and external consultants also provided updates at member briefing sessions. We found that members are actively involved in governance. Um, they will be conducting a six-month appraisal of the decision to retain the leisure service in-house, which will provide the opportunity to ensure it's being successfully implemented and that the desired outcomes are being achieved. Uh, we spoke to cabinet members who commented positively on the availability of leisure performance information and accessibility to sort of officers. Um, and at the time of our field work, officers were um, responding to member requests for more performance detail in future leisure reports. I think understandably, over recent years, a lot of the reports that have been going to members have been around the alternative delivery model and how to take that forward, whereas you know, going forwards, we'll be looking more at the more traditional performance information reports. So officers are um, tailoring those to what um, members want to receive. And the council is continuing to further strengthen its performance framework. It has already developed a performance and evaluation framework to support the new in-house model um, and is also developing an outcome measurement framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, no new recommendations there, I don't think, for the council, but uh, would uh, someone from the council want to um, make a response to that? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we welcome the report, and I uh, think all, all you've explained there is a true representative of what's gone on over the past three to four years. I think it's fair to say the council took a long and hard look at these services, I think the scrutiny on it was complete. I think members had, had big involvement. And I would be, you know, certainly, as we look back at the, the process, we've come out with having launched Mon Life this Monday um, with services that are clear on their direction. They know how they're going to be evaluated. And members were, this committee was involved in the performance and evaluation framework that, um, if you remember, we, we brought to you and was scrutinized. So I think the services, without doubt, um, over the changing period of what, as you explained, the financial model did change, and also the priorities of these services it, from um, an external to an internal um, situation that means that the, the services are prioritised, they're important as preventative services. The health agenda has really, really you know, seen significant uh, moves as the council has now got statutory obligation for health and wellbeing and corporate plans. So, um, yeah, I think all in all, it's a, it's a fair summary of where we are. And... Um, 
I don't think there's much more to add. Thank you. Thank you. Over to the committee then. Questions, observations? Anyone? Councillor Eason. Nothing to say, Chair, except uh, yes, we've spent a lot of time on this and I support the move forward. Well, thank you very much. Just to say, Chair, maybe we may, uh, to, accept the, to accept the report and the recommendations. I think that's going to be the conclusion of the committee unless there's any further comments going to be made. So thank you very much for that. Um, next item on the agenda is the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there anything anyone wants to raise about those minutes? Oh, because we've got a slightly different agenda, haven't we? It's like changed slightly. Um, okay, well, apologies for that. I've jumped the gun a little bit. Let's just... Um, Let's just deal with the, the minutes. Uh, if, if anyone's got any points they want to make about the minutes of the previous meeting, move, yeah. then just yeah, move yeah. to accept them and, and we've got a second. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, right, yes, well, uh, uh, the agenda was slightly, uh, slightly changed at the, at the end so that we now have uh, what was missing before, which was the forward work plan. And yes, I did um, have a chance to, to, to look at it. It all concentrates on one particular meeting as uh, officers will know, I, I, I do value the forward work plan to be as fully uh, fully laid out as, as possible. I think it's uh, good information as to what the work of the committee is as we look ahead. But I'm pleased to see that we have got um, what looks like quite a um, quite a few items for the agenda. For That will be our next meeting, will it, the 13th of February. So unless anyone's got any points or comments they wish to make about the forward work plan... Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, uh, make a valid point there, an observation. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the matters on the work plan at the moment are centred around the, uh, the next meeting. Uh, uh, clearly, what we would look to do uh, in supporting yourself and the committee is to develop that work programme out such that uh, when the work programme comes through to the next committee meeting, that will look to provide clarification in terms of what the committee can expect over the next 12 months. And that's exactly what I'd like to see, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, the next item then on the revised agenda is um, to confirm the, the date of the next meeting, I think, which is the 13th of February. Sorry. Um, yes, Councillor. Councillor Higginson might be better than me actually raising this, please. If you would. Yeah, on, on, the, on the work programme, Chairman, if you may, I'd like for this committee to discuss, uh, you know, the SRS and its well, I would struggle with competence if I put it that way, because this last two weeks I had I don't know many problems with uh, with uh, IT issues, and I, it, le it leads me to be phoning Blenavon to get the thing resolved, and I don't think I, I, I you know I don't think that's acceptable. I think there should be something a bit closer to heart or to need to where we are than than Blenavon. Because I find it a nuisance, to be honest, and you, and you phone up there, and you, you put in the queue waiting, and uh, like uh, a day or so ago, I was number nine in the queue. Uh, you know, that's not acceptable. Well, I think what the councillor has done there is, is make a request for there to be something on the forward work plan about our relationship with, with SRS. I don't know whether what the uh, feeling on that would be. Uh, so I'll respond in two ways. Uh, so first off, uh, in terms of uh, specific issues uh, raised, uh, you know, they, they need to be fed back into Democratic Services section. Uh, and in fact, Democratic Services Committee, uh, it's, a, I think, a, reg a, reg a regular item of discussion. So I think that's, that, you know, that's, that's the means of communicating uh, that in. Um, helpfully, Chair, um, there is, in fact, uh, a piece of work uh, being undertaken at the moment uh, around the SRS uh, by the WAO. Um, and is in fact looking at uh, the local authority relationship with the SRS, uh, you know, the value benefit that it is deriving from it. So that work is already in train. The scope, I believe, is just being finalised at the moment. Yes, if, you, if you'd like to give us some information about that, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're just finalising the scope of the work at the moment, so the work's likely to sort of take place between sort of February and... April, May ish times. I think reporting back May, June time, don't hold me to that. I, I, they're finalising the document at the moment, so it should be issued to the councils, I think, by the end of this week. Um, 
I'm not sure we'll be directly able to help you move up in the queue from number nine to number one, uh, but we will be looking at the relationship between the council and SRS, um, how it's ensuring that it gets what it wants from the service. So hopefully that will be able to provide you with some assurance over how that's working. I just want to make the point, when you're on the phone for something in excess of half an hour, it's uh, waiting to get in, there's, there's clearly something wrong with it. Can I just uh, get clarification then on which committee that report would be going to? Would that be, um, yeah, well, which, 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 which of our committees would that go to? It'll be this one. So, so we are going to have a paper on the SRS in the future. I've seen lots of hands going up. Um, we'll start with Councillor Eason. This year, yes, it's, a, it's for performance issues, not so much the manager of the, of the, of the SRS, it's all the performances. Um, I had an issue at the beginning of the week where my computer just locked out for no reason at all. Then you get into the queue of, of getting to resolve it. So it's performance issues, and I think for a report to be put forth, it would be important for our IT section officers to trawl through the records of the last 12 months to see exactly what issues are brought up, because it seems to be connectivity and performance and other problems. Councillor Watkins. I'm the chair of the Democratic Services Committee and we do actually um, discuss um, the IT issues that members face on a fairly frequent basis. But I think it's really important that members do log their concerns with the Democratic Services team that we've got so that it can then feed through into the Democratic Services Committee so that we can then bring it up properly as part of any reviews of service. So I think it's really important that members really do make sure that the Democratic Services officers know that what the issues are and try and give a bit of detail so that we can actually then look at it more seriously as a committee. Thank you. Well, that reassures me that there is a process for picking these things up. Um, Councillor Smith? Yeah, a process. It's a laughing joke, I think, within the council as to whether Councillor Smith has actually got an email system and Mrs Barnard sitting alongside you has been magnificent in her support as as a democratic services. I think I can quite honestly say that probably every other time I try to access the email <coughs> service, I am locked out. I'm not a technical person. I'm trying to do a job as an elected member. I'm trying to do that job under extremely difficult circumstances at the moment, personal circumstances. I cannot waste time as I had to waste last, what is it? A week ago that I thought enough is enough. I was on the phone for an hour talking to a very able person, I'm sure, at SRS, trying to resolve the problem for me. It was not resolved. And by which time I had an even greater domestic issue to deal with. So, so far as I'm concerned, the system is driving me to a very, very bad mental state. I know that I listen to presentations on how we will support staff, how we will help and enable people. I would like to know what support there is actually for a councillor in this council who desperately needs support at this time. So I welcome the review. I trust that, yes, you'll have the records there from Democratic Services. Democratic Services have been hugely supportive to me, and I truly value that service, Wendy. I am so grateful for what you have done for me. But um, the final feather has come on the camel's back now. So the quicker you can bring that report forward and do a trawl of all members, because it is not only myself that I'm inconvenienced, but mine is now more than an inconvenience to spend an hour of my precious time waiting to have a problem that is not resolved is not acceptable. So thank you for letting me uh, let my air. Thank you, Councillor Smith. We have we have drifted a bit away from the agenda now, um, yes, but I think I think I, I, I think the points that have been made are, are heartfelt, and we've learned a little bit more about process. And there are uh, there are ears listening to the to the comments that have been that have been made. I hope. Um, so at this point, um, I'd just like to thank you for that. For that, did you, Councillor Feekins, Did you have something you wanted to say? Okay, I'll um, I'll just move on then. Um, Okay, so we've, talk, we've confirmed the date of the next meeting. Um, and now we're moving on to a paper which is the six-month update on, on favourable opinions. So I think that is for Mr. Watham to introduce, is it not? 
Yes, it is, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, noted as the six-month update on unfavourable audit opinions. And apologies to audit committee to start with. That the last report was actually issued a year ago. So hopefully that will improve uh, in forthcoming months. But this is to give members uh, um, some information, hopefully about the progress and improvements that have been made by, ser by service managers following unfavorable internal audit reports. And just to remind members that the way we arrive at our opinions is based on the strengths and weaknesses we've identified at, within individual audits. And where we've identified an unfavorable opinion, that generally means that the, there are significant weaknesses we've identified and they outweigh the, the strengths of that particular service or um, establishment. And members will be familiar, hopefully, with most of the opinions that have been issued because they come up in my um, quarterly reports based on the um, assurances that we give in line with the completion of the audit plan. Uh, but this report, where we've deemed the opinion to be limited, then there will be more meat on the bone as to why we've identified significant weaknesses in those particular areas. We go back to 1617 uh, uh, and give an update of, of some improvements. Um, so as a brief summary on paragraph 4.3, in 1617 we had eight limited assurance opinions, 1718, eight again, 1819, six, and as at the 30th of November within 2019-20, we had two limited opinions. So where these have been reported to Audit Committee before, then I won't go into the detail of that. Um, where they've been reported to Audit Committee for the first time as a limited opinion, then there will be more detail following as, as I go through the presentation. But just to give members an idea that there has been some improvement, in paragraph 4.5, 1617 table, there were eight limited opinions and the update is generally positive. Uh, there are two which are still limited. We've talked about one which is the compliance with the Bribery Act, and that has had a second follow-up, and then the third follow-up did result in a more positive audit opinion. So that is a, definitely a step in the right direction in terms of the assurance we can provide to you that in terms of the work in appropriate public money has been spent appropriately. So there's been uh, an improvement in most of the other six areas which is reassuring moving on to 1718 paragraph 4.8 again eight reports and some had been improved there's, there's definite improvement with some of the opinions when we went and we did a follow-up review the fuel card element uh, was limited um, and there are two audits which we were due to do in this financial year which have not been done yet, so they, they'll be reported back next time. Then in 1819, six were deemed to be limited, um, and we're yet to follow up any of those six for a number of reasons within the team, but as the table outlines, they'll either be done at the, at the end of this financial year or at the beginning of 2021 financial year. So for the, the reports which have not been brought to audit committee's attention previously, they're outlined on 4.10 and these are the significant issues we identified when we undertook the audits of these particular areas. So Caldegar Castle and there's a list of significant issues. I don't intend to go through these in, in detail here but I think members can see from, from just reading them themselves that they are significant issues which need improvement and the, the, the service manager has generally agreed with the recommendations that we've made to take some action to improve that particular process so when we come back and we do a follow-up then hopefully we'll be reporting back a more positive message. Impressed account within children's services, again, a number of significant issues we identified. Agency workers, a number of significant issues, and some information, key information has been redacted. And service managers and corporate have a responsibility in terms of addressing those particular issues. With regards to fuel card follow-up, I'll talk about that separately, Chairman. A 
tenants management, again, significant issues we identified during the course of our audit, which led to a limited opinion, and management have agreed to implement our recommendations to improve the service provision moving forward. Moving on to health and safety of authorities' existing buildings, there are two significant issues there which we felt warranted a, a limited opinion. So moving on to 1920 and the two reports that have had limited to, up to the end of November, these relate to two schools, the uh, Tlandogo Primary School, uh, with three significant issues, and again the head teacher has agreed to implement the recommendations to, to, demonstrate, to show some improvements. Castle Park Primary is one we've, we picked up previously in audit committee, but there's more detail on the bone there. And again, head teacher has agreed to implement the, the necessary recommendations to improve the situation. So I'm happy to take any questions, Joan. Yeah, we note that some of the uh, some of the items uh, in the report are redacted. Uh, any discussion of that will have to take place when we move into the closed session, which we're going to um, next. But I think um, as far as everything else is concerned, we can discuss it now. Um, any comments or observations from, from members of the committee? Yes, Councillor Watkins. Um, thank you. So it's um, just basically a comment, really. Um, I was waiting to see what the actual report would be in relation to Caldecott Castle, um, because that's within my ward. Um, so I'm pleased to actually be able to see what actually the issues are, and they are noticeable. Um, so I'm quite pleased that the manager has agreed that he's going to implement that, and I look forward to the next report, and I hope things will be resolved within that scope. So thank you. Councillor Eason. Yeah, just, just, to be, just to clarify, Chair, um, agency work is going to be discussed under, under closed doors, is it? The is that last one's the redacted, redacted uh, paper? Agency um, work? Well, agency workers are redacted, some yes. redactions. Is that relevant? Uh, I think if you ask your question first, right. and then we can deal with it. It's, it's in relation to the um, contractors we use and providers. So if there's any no, relevant I, I questions. I want to ask about the contractors. Um, I'm more concerned about the following uh, the managers of these of these individuals, why, why it seems they didn't follow the agency workers' uh, rights and rules and responsibilities. Is, is that part of your report? We would check to ensure that the um, policies and procedures of the authority have been complied with, uh, and in this particular instance, they hadn't been. In terms of other legislation outside, we may have touched on that. We, we may have picked that up as part of our review. I haven't got the detail of that. What I've got is the significant issues we've identified as part of our audit testing. Any other questions or observations? Okay, I note the two ongoing areas um, is um, events, which I think you've not been able to follow that one up because there haven't been any major events. I think that's part of the, the, the issue there. Um, and the other one, I think, uh, which has been running for a while is the fuel cards one, which we're going to discuss in the closed, in the closed session. Um, I too was I thought that the agency workers thing was was um, certainly a, a, of concern, um, and that was one of the ones where I thought the committee may want to um, speak to the service manager about uh, about what was happening with with agency workers if the committee were to agree. Um, I think mainly most of the other things are going to subject be subject to a further internal audit follow up. So I'm content to leave it until they. Um, until they have done the oops. Do you want to add something? Just chair the um Well I think the 